cabinet reshuffle, Theresa May shakes up her government as she tries to hold on to power. Lashing out, Donald Trump goes after James Comey in a new Twitter rant and a city under siege. Marines in the southern Philippines suffer their own losses as they try to fight off militants. I'm Paula Newton and this is CNN Today. Welcome to everyone. The British Prime Minister's future is hanging in the balance, but she worked to steady it Sunday with a modest cabinet shuffle. Theresa May plans to meet with her parliament members on Monday and with the French president on Tuesday. Mrs. May hopes a conservative Northern Ireland party will agree to help prop up her government. Now, since last week's bungled election wiped out her party's majority, she's still working on it. And while many around Mrs. May say she is losing her grip on power, the PM so she's focused to the job at hand. There is a job to be done, and I think what the public want is to ensure that the government is getting on with that job. I've appointed cabinet members, ministers today. I'll be meeting with my cabinet tomorrow. On Tuesday, I will be going to France for meetings with President Macron. These are important in getting on with our preparations for the Brexit negotiations, but also dealing with the challenges that people see in their everyday lives. Issa Suarez is at 10 Downing Street with more on the moves Mrs. May made Sunday as critics call on her to resign. Plenty of movement here at 10 Downing Street, but not much shuffling from what was expected to be a major reshuffling of Theresa May's cabinet. The major announcement that we've had is that Michael Gove is making a comeback as Environment Secretary. Now, he's somewhat of a controversial figure here in the UK because he was accused of backstabbing in the last Tory leadership election. It seems, though, that Theresa May has put that behind and she is seems like, forgiven him. The other big story, of course, is that Damien Green has been promoted to first Secretary of State, a bit like a Deputy Prime Minister, if you will. He's a close ally and friend of Theresa May. They both went to university together, and so he has got uh, a new post. This is Theresa May really trying to shore up her authority here. The reality is very different. Theresa May treating this as business as usual, but the reality, of course, is that her power has somewhat diminished. The former Treasury Secretary, uh, George Osborne, went as far today as basically saying that she was a dead woman walking. Take a listen to what he had to say to Fareed Zakaria, basically saying that she's on borrowed time. What I think this really means is unstable government, unfortunately. It probably means the end of Mrs. May as the Conservative Party Prime Minister, although that won't necessarily happen immediately. Uh, and it will mean a lot of hard thinking in the Conservative Party about how to recover all this lost ground. Well, the Prime Minister is also facing pressure from some members of a Conservative Party. Uh, media reports here suggest that a group of Conservative MPs are throwing their weight behind Boris Johnson as the next leader of the Conservative Party. But overwhelmingly, the majority of Conservative MPs said there is no appetite right now for a leadership contest. Theresa May is also facing pressure from the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, if you remember, did so well last week. He told British media that he still uh, can be Prime Minister. Minister, even if it's just a minority government. So clearly he's putting his ducks in a row because he says she lacks all sorts of credibility. But Theresa May has really her work cut out. And you can imagine her in, in trade is very, very, it's pretty much stacking up. Um, she has to contest with the Brexit negotiations. They were going to be uh, starting pretty soon. But also that crucial negotiation she has to do with DUP. That is still ongoing. No sign of when that will be uh, concluded. But we know that the leader of the DUP is expecting me, Theresa May, here on Tuesday. But the way that the British media are covering this is pretty much as Theresa May being present but not being in power here in London. Isa Suarez, CNN, 10 Downing Street. For more on the fallout from the UK election, Daily Mirror columnist Tim Walker joins me from London. Uh, really happy to have you here. We have been keeping up with all the headlines in the mirror. There have been, there's been a lot to keep up on right now. If we deal with where Theresa May is at this moment, uh, despite former members of cabinet saying that she's a dead woman walking, um, at this point, 
the, they, she has to put the finishing touches on any deal with the DUP, and obviously she's put together her cabinet, making some concessions to people that have never would have been in her cabinet uh, before. Is it going to work? I very much doubt it. I think the voters in this country, a lot of them young people voting for the first time, yearned for Mrs. May to move a little bit towards the left, to give some concessions on this hard Brexit that she seemed to insist on putting through. And we had today the cabinet reshuffle in which nothing much happened really. It was a bit like Thomas Beckett's play, uh, Waiting for Godot. I thought of that line, nobody comes, nobody goes, it's awful. And, you know, it was on live TV and we basically saw nothing much happening except Michael Gove, who, by the way, wanted to get climate change taken from the geogra geography uh, curriculum in this, in this country. He's now in charge of, of all things, the environment. So heaven knows what kind of a message this is putting out. And the message that it is seem to be putting out, though, some people are saying is one of compromise. Now, we will turn to Boris Johnson. Now, look, if there's any treachery on his part, we must say he comes by it honestly. But he is trying to portray himself as someone who's actually, at this moment, loyal to Theresa May. I want you to have a listen to what he said. And I genuinely said. think that the people of this country, this is the third year running that we have chivied them out to the polls. Uh, we have asked them to vote on a general election, then a referendum, then another general election. I think they've had enough of this stuff. Uh, I think what they want is for politicians to get on, deliver Brexit, and deliver on their priorities. And Theresa May is by far the best person, and she's the best placed person to deliver that. Well, I think he obviously was very unhappy with what Boris Johnson said. Boris Johnson, best known in this country at the moment as the man who promised £350 million extra a week uh, for the NHS, whereas in fact it's clear now that the Brexit that is going to actually take place is actually going to impoverish the, the NHS enormously and will probably make recruitment very difficult for the NHS because so many staff come from abroad. The Mail on Sunday, a paper, by the way, where Boris Johnson's sister Rachel works, a paper you would imagine knows a little bit about what's going on in Boris Johnson's head, it revealed this morning that Boris Johnson was going to run for the leadership. It's go, 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 apparently, a uh, close aide to Boris Johnson said, you know, in the wake of Theresa May's misfortunes. Uh, Clearly, he had to deny it because it was obviously people were horrified that Boris Johnson, possibly one of the most discredited politicians we have in this country, was even considering uh, running to be prime minister because it was not, it would be a terrible response really to the views of the electorate, which were made very clear that we didn't want a hard Brexit, that young people felt neglected, and that there was a general sense that the government should move away from the hard right and head a little bit more to the centre ground. But also in terms of Jeremy Corbyn, all of this intrigue in the Tory party, what is Jeremy Corbyn getting all of this? I mean, it's extraordinary. As many people have commented, he's a person who lost the election acting like he's won. Well, you see, he did increase uh, the number of seats that Labour has. Uh, people had very low expectations for Jeremy Corbyn, but in the event, he actually did a lot better than expected. However, I think maybe this praise for him is a little bit overdone. The reality is he should have won this election by a landslide. It wasn't so much that people loved Jeremy, it was more that they hated Theresa May. <laughs> I mean, I was one of the few commentators in this country to say that I expected there to be a surprising result in this election, not least because I live in a constituency called Kensington and Chelsea, which has always voted Conservative. It's the most blue-blooded constituency, or at least it used to be seen, in this country. But all the old Tory blue winces, the old Conservative matriarchs, I knew just by talking to them, they hated Theresa May. They did not want a hard Brexit. They didn't like seeing uh, the value of their investments, the pound in their pocket, if you like, collapsing in value as a result of this ludicrous policy. Tim, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Now, Downing Street also says to there, today that there will be no change to the invitation from the Queen to U.S. President Donald Trump. Now, despite a report that claims he was planning to actually delay a visit to the U.K., the White House also denies the Guardian reporting, which states Mr. Trump had expressed unease over his perceived unpopularity in Britain to the British Prime Minister. Opposition Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn had this to say, though, on Twitter, cancellation of President Trump's state visit is welcome especially after his attack on London's mayor and withdrawal.
from Paris climate deal. Donald Trump, of course, also taking to Twitter where he lashed out at fired FBI Director James Comey. Now, the U.S. president tweeted this. I believe the James Comey leaks will be far more prevalent than anyone ever thought possible. Quote, totally illegal, question mark, very cowardly, exclamation mark. I want to remind everyone the punctuation is very important, not the least it's important in legal terms. Now, Mr. Trump, referring to Comey's testimony there, that he asked a friend to give a memo of conversations with the president to a reporter there by leaking them, but some believe Mr. Trump should focus his attention elsewhere. You may be the first president in history to go down because you can't stop inappropriately talking about an investigation that if you just were quiet would clear you. My advice to the president is every day you're talking about Jim Comey and not the American people and their needs and their desires, their hopes and their dreams, you're making a mistake. Yeah, many Republicans would agree with that. And just one week after Comey testified before lawmakers, U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions may do the same thing. Now, he's expected to answer questions before the Senate Intelligence Committee on Tuesday, which is looking into contacts between Trump campaign officials and Russia. We want to bring in our Athena Jones, our White House correspondent. She is traveling with the president in New Jersey. Uh, Athena, you know, stunning in a sense that... Um, Mr. Sessions decided that he wanted to testify, and yet a little confusion. Like, is it going to happen, and is it going to be open or closed? Well, those are other questions still, Paula. Uh, uh, on Sunday afternoon, we haven't heard final word from the Senate Intelligence Committee about whether he's going to be able to testify on Tuesday uh, and whether it will be open to the public or a closed session. We do know that investigators on Capitol Hill have a lot of questions for the Attorney General. We'll see uh, how soon they get to, to ask him those questions. But among those questions are about uh, his involvement in the firing of the FBI Director uh, Jim Comey. Comey has said that he believes he was fired because of his handling of the Russia investigation. Sessions, you'll remember, was supposed to have recused himself from the Russia investigation. It's also likely they want to talk to him about uh, another thing that Comey said in his hearing and in his memos, which is that Sessions was one of the people who was lingering in the Oval Office after the president uh, called for the room to be cleared so he could have a private conversation with Comey. It was that conversation that Comey says during which the president said, uh, asked him to, or he said he hoped he would let the investigation into his former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, go. Uh, we could also see them ask the Sessions about this possible third undisclosed meeting that Sessions may have had with Russia's ambassador. Sergey Kislyak. Uh, Comey referred to this obliquely during his uh, open session testimony last week, but then in a closed uh, private session with the Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, he explained that this is exactly what he had been referring to, this idea that Sessions may have had yet another meeting with Russia's ambassador. So there are certainly a lot of questions that investigators have for Sessions, uh, but the question mark here is when exactly they'll be able to ask him those questions. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of questions, a lot of fallout. We're still following Athena, and also that issue of tapes. You know, first brought up by the president himself. Are there tapes or aren't there tapes and when are we going to learn for sure? Well, we should learn uh, next week. We heard today from one of the members of the president's uh, legal team who said that the president will address this matter uh, next week. Uh, but this is something that has been on the minds not only of reporters constantly asking, but also members of Congress. Listen to what uh, Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein and GOP Senator Susan Collins had to say about this today on State of the Union. He should voluntarily turn them over, not only to the Senate Intelligence Committee, but to the special counsel. So I don't think a subpoena should be necessary, and I don't understand why the president just doesn't clear this matter up once and for all. There were no witnesses. If there are tapes, please, and the, the president's equivocal on this, bring those tapes forward. So there's a lot of interest, of course, in any potential recordings that may exist. I should, I should highlight, though, that uh, Jay Sekulow, the president's a lawyer, uh, did say that the, the question of whether there are recordings will be answered next week. But that doesn't mean the question of whether they would hand over those recordings to congressional investigators will be answered next week. So 
Uh, the mystery continues. Yeah, Paula. And, and the plot thickens. Wow, that is another incredible footnote. Athena, thanks for following all this. Appreciate it. Yeah, and as this debate continues in Washington over the fallout from Comey's testimony, uh, we wanted to take the pulse of voters elsewhere in the country. And this is going to be really interesting for you to hear. What did they think of the hearings and Comey's accusation that the president is a liar? Our Gary Tuckman spoke to a panel of voters from Ohio, a state that Mr. Trump won. First thing I want to ask you, it is a crime when you testify before Congress to lie. That is perjury. You can go to prison for it. Raise your hand if you believe James Comey lied at all. Four of you believe he lied. Yep. Raise your hand. He, he says that Donald Trump, quote, told lies plain and simple. Raise your hand if you believe Donald Trump has lied at all about the situation. None of you believe that. For those of you who did not raise your hands, if neither person lied, how could that be possible? They tell different things. Who didn't raise their hand? Why do you think if nobody lied, how could that have happened? Well, first of all, things can be distorted and appear like lies. And I think maybe the media might have distorted some things and the media. now we're not getting both sides. Now you raised your hand. You, do you think Mr. Comey should go to jail? I think that uh, my impression of Comey at the beginning of this was that he was kind of a L.A. Ness kind of guy, the way he went out there, Martha Stewart. Uh, but as this, especially with this testimony today, he's more like an Ian Fleming where he wants to be the next novelist. Uh, a lot of things that he came up with was seemed like he's more inclined to fiction. One of the things he testified about, he said he was in a room with President Trump. President Trump told his attorney general and his son-in-law to get out. And he says President Trump told him he hoped he would let it go regarding the Flynn investigation. My question for you, a lot of people are arguing hope. That means he didn't order him. But if your superior, your boss, or when you're little, if your parent says they hope you do something, isn't that an imperative that you do it? Or is that not necessarily an imperative? He's been manipulated by the Clintons, too, when uh, Lynch told him to uh, overlook the meeting with... Uh, right, let me just tell you, though, Hillary Clinton right now is not president. I I'm talking about this situation. So when he is told I, Comey... from the, what he says. So you don't think that Comey's telling the truth about right, that? Right. What do you think? I think Mr. Uh, Comey uh, should have said something at that time. Should have said something to who? To Mr. Uh, Trump? Mr. Trump. What should he have no, said to Mr. Trump? That I cannot do that. Uh, I have to go on with investigations, etc. And yeah, Mr. Flynn, we have to do it. And he did not do it. I was never asked why I didn't think he was being truthful, but I believe he didn't adequate, adequately explain why he couldn't just tell Trump that uh, this is inappropriate or tell the chief of staff or DOJ to tell Trump. He continued on with that and he couldn't adequ adequately explain that. That's why, you know, I feel the whole, the whole thing was wrapped around this. Mr. Comey says he believes he was fired because of the Russia investigation. Interestingly, Donald Trump has said, I fired him because of Russia. Is there a problem with that? No. No, I don't have a Why problem. isn't there a problem with that? I don't have a problem with that. First of all, Mr. Trump represents the United States of America. President Trump is our president, and he sets a standard for everything. And when he, but he had, let me just say, he had commented many times, according to the testimony, that he liked the job that Mr. Comey was doing. Then all of a sudden, he's firing him because he doesn't like. Well, the, I think you try to be uplifting and encouraging to your quote unquote um, employees, mm -hmm. but also he sent Mr. Comey several opportunities to be forthright and honest with him, forthcoming with some answers, and Mr. Comey kind of dropped the ball on that. And let me ask you this before we go. I think I may know the answer to this, but a show of hands. How many of you feel better about Donald Trump, your president, after this hearing? I've always how many of you feel worse about Donald Trump? I guess you all raised your hands the first time. <laughs> so you think that was a success for Donald Trump, but not for Mr. Comey? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? And it proves that after the hearings, people pretty much maintain the opinions that they had going into that hearing. Now, off to France. France's new president, Emmanuel Macron, is enjoying what appears to be another stunning victory. Now, his party is on course to win more than 400 seats in the lower house in the first round of parliamentary elections. That's about 70% of the 577 available seats. Now, this would give Macron a huge majority to further his political and economic reforms. Far-right leader Marie Le Pen, on the other hand, is blaming low voter turnout for her party. Right now, it's only winning about 13% of the votes. Ahead on CNN Today, a grim reminder of the dangers as Philippine forces battle militants in Mindanao. We'll talk with the CNN Philippines senior correspondent. That's next.
new inside the Middle East. Join Becky Anderson and meet the people shaping culture across the region. This month, exploring Beirut with the modern face of Arabic music, Yasmin Hamdan. This is where I started, where I get my vitamins, where I get my inspiration. And we're on the set of her new music videos. Inside the Middle East, Wednesday on CNN, in association with MISC. CNN Supercharged. Plug into the first ever all-electric racing series, Formula E. Go behind the scenes with Nikki Shields in the cities hosting the E-Pre action. Meet the drivers racing through downtown street circuits across the globe. And check out the technology driving us all towards a greener future. CNN Supercharged, Saturday on CNN, in association with DHL. What defines cutting-edge investments in today's global real estate market? Host John Defterios in One Square Meter gives you a rare peek behind the trendiest places, the best developments, and unique projects around the world. From San Francisco to Shanghai, One Square Meter seeks out the most interesting places and takes an inside look at international properties. One Square Meter, Tuesday in Connect the World with Becky Anderson, in association with MR. All new African Voices. This week, self-taught artists with an eye for detail and success. I will start drawing characters and, you know, imagining what will happen with those characters. And that's how it started. African Voices. Today on CNN, in association with GLOW. Philippine forces say they believe they've killed the leaders of an ISIS-linked group on the island of Mindanao. Now, they say there are strong indications that brothers Omar and Abdullah Maute were killed in a gunfight in Marawi. Philippine troops have been fighting for three weeks to try and retake the city from militants. Government forces suffered heavy losses in a 14-hour battle on Friday. Thirteen Marines were wounded, were killed, 40 wounded. David Santos is a senior correspondent for CNN Philippines, and he joins us now from um, Iligan City, and it's not far from uh, Marawawi. So I want to ask you right off the bat here, it seems that the president has put even a deadline on this, saying that, look, we will retake the city in about a week by Independence Day. I mean, what is your assessment about how the fighting is going so far? Well, Paula, the Philippine Armed Forces is now making a clarification that the June 12 deadline was more of a projection than an assurance it can end the crisis in Marawi City. Well, it's been uh, three weeks since uh, violence broke out in Marawi. Close to 270 people are dead, 58 are government troopers, more than 200,000 people uh, displaced from their homes. So the fighting is concentrated in at least uh, three villages in the heart of Marawi City. Uh, ground commanders describe Describe it as very intense and brutal uh, close quarters combat fighting is block by block, house by house, building by building. Maute fighters apparently have the terrain advantage since they are strategically positioned in fortified structures while snipers use mosque uh, towers to fire on government forces. Now there, uh, there's also the risk of civilian casualties since a still undetermined number of residents are still trapped in the war zone. Clearly as we speak, Paula, there's still no definite end in sight to this violence in Marawi City. Yeah, David, I will clarify. I made a mistake. Independence Day is today uh, in, uh, in the Philippines, is it not? And they, the, pro the military had actually promised that. And it's interesting that you point out, obviously, the civilian casualties, which gets more to the point about how long this is going, going to go on. Uh, a lot of confusion, too, by the president in terms of what involvement the U.S. has had and is going to have in this battle going, going forward. What can you tell us? Well, Philippine uh, defense officials insist whatever help the U.S. government providing now is purely limited to technical assistance. This is provided for by the Mutual Defense Treaty, which has been in effect for close to seven decades now. Now, Regional Military Commander Carlito Galvez says there are no American boots on the ground. The Philippine uh, Constitution prohibits uh, 
foreign uh, forces in engaging in direct combat here. Now, technical assistance come in the form of the use of spy planes, as well as the use of precision guided ammunitions for airstrikes and bombing runs on enemy target. Now, Philippine Armed Forces Chief Eduardo Año telling reporters here on Sunday that those behind the attack on Marawi appears to have a direct link to ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Now, President Duterte also on Sunday attributing uh, the Marawi violence to Baghdadi, who he says, and we quote, ordered the conduct of terroristic activities here in the Philippines. Paula. Yeah, so interesting that he made that direct link to the leader of ISIS uh, and we will continue to watch this. David, thank you so much for being with us. Really appreciate it as we continue to follow that developing story. Now, Iran is sending food aid to Qatar to ease the pain of its isolation from Gulf Arab neighbors. Iran Air has shipped vegetables and other food items on at least four flights. It says it will continue doing so. Nine nations, including Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and the UAE, have cut ties with Qatar, accusing it of supporting terrorism and destabilizing the entire region. Now, under normal circumstances, Qatar imports 80% of its food from Gulf Arab nations. Now, the diplomatic isolation is also taking an emotional toll on residents of the Emirate. Um, it could tear some Qataris away from their loved ones. Jamana Karatse has the story. The holy month of Ramadan is a time when extended families meet and enjoy generations old traditions. But the political crisis in the Gulf is threatening to tear this family apart. Dr. Wafa al Yazidi is a Qatari single mother. Her children are Bahraini citizens. In Gulf countries, children take the citizenship of their father. And when Bahrain, along with other countries, severed ties with Qatar this month, it ordered its nationals to leave Qatar immediately. I am in, in a risk of losing my children. What I believe it's my dream all my life to raise them around me and to they get married from around me and to to be happy all that day. Now I may lose my children any any minute. The situation is uncertain, but they believe that if they defy this order, Al Yazidi's children would lose their Bahraini passports, leaving them stateless. My mom raised us by herself. Um, it's tough, especially because she's a single mother, but. That made us closer. And now, after 21 years, to decide us to pull us apart based on the passport that we have, I mean, it, families are beyond passports. It makes no sense to separate them based on what your passport are. I mean, at the end, we're all humans, aren't we? I've been raised all my life in Qatar. I've lived with my mother. I've never, like, I've gone to Bahrain four times and it was just to visit family and now I don't have any family that's worth visiting in Bahrain. I wouldn't classify myself as a Bahraini because you know there's an English saying it says your home is where your heart is and my heart is in this place. For Rashid who is an aeronautical engineer and Al Anud who's studying medicine at a branch of an Ivy League university in Doha this is not just about being separated from their mother. My point of view right now is my education and to further develop myself and it's only that and that's what really what's really important to me and this country has given me everything to do that and then they say go back to the country that holds your 48 pages of a document it's absurd according to Qatari government figures nearly 6500 Qatari citizens are married to Emiratis Saudis or Bahrainis it's not right I mean, children should never be separated from their parents, especially by force. I don't understand it. I mean, especially with like a region that has multiple families from different countries, it makes no sense. I never think that it would be happening in our country and in the Gulf region. By who? By countries who they are as brothers and sisters and neighbors who they live all their life with us. Why? No one knows how or when this crisis will end, leaving thousands of families like this one living in limbo. Jamana Karachi, CNN, Doha. Coming up, the British Prime Minister is banking on a Northern Ireland party to help her get votes through. Why many people from within her own party are against a deal with the DUP. All new Inside Africa. Unlocking the mysteries behind the continent you thought you knew. Skate 
soccer becomes a game changer for these Ghanaian athletes. When you get out there, you are not going to see physically talented people. You are going to see top class athletes. Inside Africa, Tuesday, only on CNN, in association with Zenith Bank. Equestrian global champions is in the south of France in Cannes, mixing glamour and top class sports. This is one of 15 stunning locations around the world, which makes up the Global Champions Tour and Global Champions League. CNN Equestrian Global Champions, Friday on CNN. Sunday on CNN. Get a jump on the U.S. political scene with Inside Politics. The Republican president threatened to oppose members of his own party. Then, State of the Union with Jake Tapper. Should President Trump apologize to President Obama and to the American people? Fareed Zakaria, GPS. We are living through a sea change in politics. And connect the world with Becky Anderson. With respect, sir, let me just stop you there government. for one moment. That is not the government. Sunday on CNN. It's taken 10 years, the business traveler is back. Lagos, Nigeria. The difficulty of flying in this country. There are more private planes than commercial aircraft. The boutique hotels take on the chains. I think bring it on. You do? And a gigantic gallery of African art. Amazing. A true Nigerian welcome on the next CNN Business Traveler. In association with Invest Macedonia and Macedonia Tourism. I'm Anderson Cooper. This is CNN. Hello and welcome to CNN Today. I'm Paula Newton. We want to get straight to our top story. As shoppers in Qatar stock up, on, stuck up during a blockade from the country's biggest suppliers, Iran is sending help. Cargo flights from Iran are delivering vegetables and other food items to Qatar. Nine nations have cut ties with the Emirate, accusing it of supporting terrorism. It appears French voters are overwhelmingly backing President Emmanuel Macron's new political party. BFMTV is projecting Macron's party will win a majority, taking more than 400 of the 577 seats in the lower house. During the first round of parliamentary elections, the second round is next Sunday. The British Prime Minister plans to meet with her cabinet Monday after a reshuffle. Theresa May told Sky News she picked ministers who, in her words, reflect the wealth of talent and experience across the Conservative Party. She's working to cobble together a government following last week's disastrous election results. Mrs. May hopes a Northern Ireland Conservative Party will agree to help prop up her government, but as Nick Robertson reports, much of the UK may take issue with the DUP's social policies. Elections barely over, the DUP, or Democratic Unionist Party, Northern Ireland's most powerful Protestant party, is already in talks with Theresa May's Conservatives. This is DUP heartland territory, and the writing on the wall sums up the thinking. The Ulster Northern Ireland conflict is about nationality. This we shall maintain. They are proud to be British. The Union Jack is at the centre there, fiercely loyal to the Crown, and they're ready to fight for it. Not all unionists are as strident as the murals paint. Here, people wanted yeah. to vote unionists. Reverend Mervyn Gibson is a moderate unionist, knows DUP policy well, sees the May Alliance as good for his community. I think it's very simple. Uh, they're both parties are committed to the United Kingdom, and I think uh, any cooperation between them will be good for the United Kingdom. Across town, in the Catholic or nationalist community that aspires to Irish unity, the expectation the DUP are a political outlier that will cause May problems. They're against uh, an Irish language act. They're against uh, marriage equality for gay and lesbian couples. In this city, miles of peace wall divide Protestant Unionist and Catholic Nationalist. Three decades of sectarian conflict ended 20 years ago. Still, distrust runs deep. And where that trust is bridged at Northern Ireland's power-sharing government, Stormont, suspended earlier this year, 
The impact of Theresa May's DUP agreement could hit hardest. The power-sharing government here collapsed amid acrimony over hundreds of millions of dollars committed to a green energy scheme managed by the DUP and claims by Sinn Féin of inequality in here. Negotiations to restart need May's neutral mediation and now she'll be perceived as deeply in the DUP corner. We have never seen the British government as being neutral or being impartial or being a referee. You know, sometimes they present themselves as carrying the white man's burden. You know, they are players. The, the unionist parties are committed to seeing the assembly back up and running. Uh, I think there are other parties who want to play politics, particularly Sinn Féin. Far from securing a strong future, Prime Minister May's reliance on the DUP could be saddling her with yet more problems. Northern Ireland's uneasy peace. Nick Robertson, CNN, Belfast, Northern Ireland. Hmm. You're watching CNN Today, and we will be right back with more news. New African Voices. This week, self taught artists with an eye for detail and success. I will start drawing characters and, you know, imagining what will happen with those characters. And that's how it started. African Voices. Today on CNN, in association with GLOW. news you need delivered to your inbox at the end of the New York day before Asia opens. CNNMoney.com slash quest. And watch Quest Means Business on CNN. CNN Supercharged. Plug into the first ever all-electric racing series, Formula E. Go behind the scenes with Nikki Shields in the cities hosting the E-Pre action. Meet the drivers racing through downtown street circuits across the globe. And check out the technology driving us all towards a greener future. CNN Supercharged. Saturday on CNN in association with DHL. Hong Kong is bracing for a soggy week, unfortunately, as a tropical storm approaches. Allison Chinchar has what you need to know. How bad is it going to be, Allison? It depends on where exactly on China's coast you are. The coastal regions are likely going to pick up some of the stronger winds from this. And here's a look at Tropical Storm Murbach. Again, right now, winds about 65 kilometers per hour. They are gusting up to around 85 kilometers per hour. Movement is to the north-northwest about 26 kilometers per hour. So it's got a pretty good amount of forward speed to it, but it doesn't have much time until it actually makes landfall. Again, we're expecting it within the next 24 hours, but before then, you'll start to even pick up some of the impacts from some of the outer bands of the storm. So again, the winds are going to quickly increase, as are the rain bands, bringing down some pretty torrential downpours at times. Then once it becomes inland, it starts to weaken very quickly. In fact, by the time it really begins to make its exit back out to water, it's really likely just going to be a remnant low at that point, and that's only about 48 hours from now. So again, this this is all going
going to take place pretty quickly, going from a pretty intense tropical storm to pretty much nothing in about 48 to 72 hours from now. They do have blue warnings out along the Guangdong region, right through there. Just to the east of Hong Kong is where we expect the main center point to make landfall. But that doesn't mean that Hong Kong is in the clear. Again, you're going to have some of those heavier bands around the side of it. Now, this is the, officially the second storm of, this, of the year so far. Uh, here's a look at the winds as they begin to cross over. Right at landfall, right along the coastal regions, you could be looking at, say, around 150 kilometers per hour, maybe even perhaps slightly higher than that, especially along the eastern section of the storm. But again, once we get into that landfall, once it's over land, it's going to decrease pretty quickly. Now, this is also going to line up with that stationary front that's been pretty much hovering here for weeks. That's going to exacerbate a lot of the rain that's going to be here. So you'll notice some pretty intense rainfall totals, especially along the coast, widespread. We're talking 50 to 100 millimeters of rain, but there will be some areas that could pick up, say, as much as 150 to even 200 millimeters of rain. Here's that stationary front we talked about, allowing bringing a lot of those plum rains to the region and adding that tropical moisture into it is what's going to help to increase a lot of that rain to the region. So again, you've got the concern for very strong winds, but you also have the concern for flooding potential due to the amount of rain. Yeah, and it's interesting. You have to watch the kickback at the end, right? I mean, all of that water, that is a lot of water. Allison, thanks so much for keeping track of it for us. Thanks. Appreciate it. Now, the Taliban have claimed responsibility for a deadly attack on U.S. soldiers. It happened in eastern Afghanistan on Saturday. Our Diane Gallagher has more on what was apparently an insider attack. The Afghan Taliban is claiming responsibility for this attack, but there's no independent confirmation as of yet. Now, it is important to note that this area where this happened is an ISIS stronghold. The Pentagon said that three U.S. soldiers were killed. One was injured. That injured soldier has been evacuated for medical care. And one U.S. official said that a member of an Afghan security forces opened fire on the soldiers during a joint U.S.-Afghan operation. Vice President Mike Pence speaking in Wisconsin on Saturday, asked people to pray for the families of the soldiers who were killed. On my way here, I was informed that U.S. service members were killed and wounded in an attack in Afghanistan. The president and I have been briefed. The details of this attack will be forthcoming. But suffice it to say, when heroes fall, Americans grieve, and our thoughts and prayers are with the families of these American heroes. Now, this happened in the Achin district. It's an ISIS stronghold near the border of Pakistan, and it's where the U.S. and Afghan troops have been carrying out a months long offensive against the terror group's local affiliate, ISIS K. It's also where the U.S. dropped what is known as the mother of all bombs back in April. Now, during that same month, three U.S. soldiers were killed in two different incidents there. Two Army Rangers killed during a U.S. Afghan forces joint raid, and earlier that month, an Army Special Forces soldier was killed fighting ISIS K. U.S. officials Officials believe that ISIS has somewhere between six and 800 fighters in Afghanistan. About 8,400 U.S. troops are there now. Diane Gallagher, CNN, Washington. And we leave you with multiple locations around the world where many people have been gearing up for Gay Pride Week. Now, dozens of marches are planned across the United States, including this Equality March for Unity and Pride, which took place in Washington, D.C. on Sunday. Gay rights activists say they wanted to air their grievances to the Trump administration regarding recent decisions involving the LGBT community and promises not met from his campaign. Well, thanks for watching us here. I'm Paula Newton. World Sport with Patrick Snell is up next, but I will be back in 15 minutes with a lot more news on CNN Today.